Welcome to the Exploring Haskell section of Fundamentals of Practical Haskell Programming. In this section, we will learn about our first real Haskell programs, more visual aspects of programs, including layout and how this interacts with program semantics, how to explore types, values, and expressions in GHCI, and finally, some more advanced GHCI techniques, including interactive debugging. Welcome to the first video, entitled Our First Haskell Programs. Strictly speaking, these are not truly our first Haskell program since we did look at a few in the previous section. However, these are the first programs that we'll dig into in some depth. This video will give us more of a taste of Haskell syntax to prepare us for later videos, relate syntax to semantics, introduce a lot of new terminology, and build up some bigger programs from smaller examples. So without further ado, here is our first Haskell program. And it's completely empty. So we can enter the following main equals put strlun hello world and this is the classic hello world program haskell style the elements that we see here are some names an operator and a string literal the names are main and this appears on the left hand side of an equals sign put strlun which appears within an expression on the right hand side of the equals sign the equal sign is the operator, and this is the type of value naming operator, and is either pronounced equals or is. And thirdly, we see the string literal delimited with double quote characters. Thus, this declaration can be pronounced as main is put strlun hello world. Semantically speaking, this program binds or assigns the name of variable main before the equal sign to the expression put strlun hello world on the right hand side of the equal sign. This right hand side applies the function putstrlearn to the argument hello world. Putstrlearn is a function that takes a single argument of type string and evaluates to an action that when executed will print the string to the terminal and produce no result. Haskell's standard string type is a list of Unicode characters. Thus main itself evaluates to an IO action that produces no result. And when this action is later invoked or executed, it will print the Unicode characters hello world to the terminal. Let's figure out how to run this program. We'll be using stack, so I've created a stack.yaml configuration file in the same directory as the source file to tell the stack command which resolver to use. As specified in the installation and setup guide for this course, we'll be using the LTS 7.8 resolver. We'll talk more about that later. And furthermore, we're not going to reference any packages other than the standard base package. So there's an empty list of packages. And base is Haskell's standard library that is, by default at least, available to all programs. So we'll open a terminal. And we're going to use stack's run ghc command to quickly run the program. Stack run ghc program.hs. And there you go. It is exactly what you'd think. This program will be fully type checked and have unambiguous types assigned to each element before the program is run. Furthermore, the language specification is such that it doesn't matter whether this is done by a compiler or an interpreter. The program will still be statically typed. And in fact, RunGHC is an interpreter, and RunGHC is used to quickly and iteratively run programs. So while RunGHC is an interpreter, the semantics of the program will be identical to those produced using the GHC compiler using the stack GHC command. You can also run here, stack GHC program.hs. That takes a little while longer. Haskell does support type signatures. And these are optional in most cases and only required in others and typically only required to eliminate type ambiguities. This program does not currently use type signatures, but we can add some in and run the program again. We'll go to the top here, we'll add a new line and we're going to type main double colon IO open parens close parens. We we'll save the file and we will run it again. It yields exactly the same result. And just to convince you that it really is compiling that program, I can put some garbage into it, save the file, and attempt to run it again. There we go, we get an error message in the expression put strlun hello world with my garbage. So we'll take the garbage out and we'll look at the type signature again. This uses the double colon operator to specify the type of the name main on its left hand side. This operator is typically pronounced has type. Next in the signature, after the double colon, is IO. 
IO is a type class and is a family of abstract data types representing actions that can be invoked to perform input and output. We'll talk much more about this later. Then we see open and closed parentheses. This is pronounced unit and is a type containing a single value also named unit and also represented by open and closed parentheses. This unit value is conceptually equivalent to a tuple with zero elements. Since the type unit has exactly this single value, it effectively conveys no information. Unit is often, though not exclusively, used by IO actions when all we really care about are the side effects of the action. And the side effect in this case of the particular main function we're looking at here is the writing of characters to the terminal. It should be noted that there is nothing magic about unit. It can be stored in collections and operated upon much like any other value. Overall, therefore, the type signature is pronounced main has type IO unit. And in English, this means that main is a function that evaluates to an IO action which produces no value. Now let's do something a little more interesting. Here I have a text file, numbers.txt, and it consists of 100 random integers. So let's go back to our program. We're going to add a do block and add another line, content from read file, numbers.txt. And then we'll modify the last line to do put str learn on content. And this evolution of our little program introduces some additional syntax and references a new function from the prelude, namely read file. The prelude is a standard module that exports a large subset of the functions defined in Haskell's base package. And the prelude typically exports very commonly used functions. The new syntax is the do here and the left pointing arrow here. The left pointing arrow is pronounced from or drawn from. The code is thus pronounced content is drawn from read file applied to numbers.txt. This is do notation and is a syntactic convenience introduced to make working with type classes like IO easier. It is much more general than IO, though this will be its primary usage throughout this course. Suffice it to say for now that main evaluates to an action of type IO unit. It is the sequential combination of two other IO actions. The first, using read file applied to numbers.txt, highlighted here. This is the IO action that returns the contents of this file as a string extracted using the drawn from operator. The second action is the action resulting from applying putstro learn to content, where content is the value yielded by the previous read file. The type of read file is file path maps to IO string, i.e. when applied to a file path, it evaluates to an action that produces a string. Let's run this program. DAC run ghc program.hs. There we go. Simply dumps out the contents of numbers.txt. Let's also take a look at the print function. Here we're using put str learn. We can use print instead. Let's run the program again. So observe how the output is slightly different. Putstrlearn is used to output a string followed by a new line character. Print, instead, can be applied to any value that implements the show type class, and it's typically used to display a representation of a value for diagnostic purposes. At this point, we're ready to really go for it. Close the terminal. I'm going to open up program4.hs. Here is a development of our single program, extended to report various statistics about the values contained in the file numbers.txt. As well as introducing two new top-level functions, read ints and min max, this program demonstrates a number of other new things. We see a few new functions from Haskell standard prelude, and in particular in this program we see map, which we've seen before, higher order function that applies a function element-wise to a list and yields another list. Read, this is a polymorphic function which reads values of any type that implements the read type class from a string. Words which takes a string and splits it on white space word boundaries. Foldr, this is a higher order function for reduction that we've seen before. Obviously read file, said before. Length, this is a function which evaluates to the number of elements in a list. Sum, this is a function which evaluates to the sum of the elements of a list of numerical values. And from integral, which converts an integral number to another numeric type. Of course, we've seen print before. We also see some new operators, most of which are just functions exported by the prelude. Double right arrow, pronounced implies, introduces a type constraint into a type signature. Right arrow, here, here, 
is pronounced maps to and is using type signatures and anonymous functions. Colon here is pronounced cons, and this is used to construct a list from a new head element and an existing tail, or in this case, to pattern match against such a list to deconstruct it to its head and its tail. We also see less than and greater than, which have their usual meaning. And down here we have divide. Let's look at read ints. Read ints has a let binding. This introduces the new variable w's, ws pronounced w's, because it's more than one w. And this is words applied to the function argument s. And this introduces the name w's into the expression map read ws w's to the right hand side of the in keyword. Together, these produce a function which splits a string on word boundaries and then applies the read function to each substring to produce a list of ints. And this is explicitly shown by the type signature up here. This is read as read ints has type string mapping to a list of int. In minmax, we use fold r, which we've seen before. We also see just and nothing. Since these are capitalized, we can tell immediately that they are most likely types, type constructors, or data constructors. And indeed, in the context of these expressions, they must in fact be data constructors. And in fact, they belong to the maybe type shown in the type signature. And they're used to construct data instances of this type. We can also see that minmax defines two different bodies or cases which are associated with different patterns of the first argument, which is a list of A. The first body deals with the case that the list has a head, H, and a tail, T. This is the case when the list is not empty. Meanwhile, the second body handles the case of an empty list, and we use an underscore to mean otherwise or anything. This matches anything that isn't matched by any other patterns previously given for a function's body. We will go into pattern matching as well as the maybe type constructor in much more detail later. So this function applies fold r to an anonymous function. This is indicated by the backslash, which is supposed to be a rude approximation of a lambda character. And it makes use of parentheses both to construct pairs, as in this case, and to pattern match or deconstruct pairs. And we also see if, then, and else for conditional expressions. We also pass another pair as the initial value to the fold r, and this is the pair of two head elements. And then this is also applied to t, the tail, i.e. the remaining elements of the list. So overall, this function yields the minimum and maximum values from a list of some ordered type, as long as the list is not empty, otherwise it will return nothing. And this is a polymorphic function that can operate on lists of any type A for which the odd A constraint holds. Odd is a type class that is implemented for types for which a meaningful ordering exists. We also introduce many of our own names in different lexical scopes. So let's look at main. Main also uses do notation, and it has another let binding. This let binding, however, is in the context of a do block. And in these situations, let bindings do not have an in clause. This is because names introduced by let are available from that point onwards to the end of the do block, so there's already an implied scope. Main computes various values from this list of numbers. We read the integers, we get the count of the numbers, we get the sum of the numbers, which we call total, and we compute the arithmetic mean by dividing the total by the count. It's interesting to note how Haskell handles numeric types. Total and count both have integral types and integral values and must therefore be explicitly converted from integral before the slash divide operator can be applied to them. This is a good example of how Haskell is always explicit about numeric conversions. And while the absence of the kinds of implicit conversions that the C family of languages and dynamic languages perform is sometimes a little jarring because you have to add these extra from integral evaluations, the most important thing is you never have to worry about an errant, lossy, implicit conversion in Haskell. A conversion that is not explicit in the code, which discards information. We also evaluate min-max applied to values, result in range, and we print out the results. Now let's run the program. Now let's run the program. Stack.
run ghc program 4.hs. And here we see the output. Scroll down so we can see the print code that corresponds to it. So the count is, as we would expect, 100. The total happens to be 4,207, and thus the arithmetic mean is 42.07. And the range of values in the file is from 0, the minimum, to 98, the maximum. We also see just here. This is the representation of the maybe value, and you'll see that it includes the data constructor, just, used to construct the data instance. So this has been a lightning tour of a more complicated program. We will go through all of these elements in more detail later.